Hello, hello. So, we are live. Mike is working. Looks like LibreOffice is up and ready to go. So, I thought we would, uh, we're going to work on a module. Uh, at least the pre-planned stage, transitioning into the mid-level uh, of the design. Kind of able to run it the way that it is, uh, but I like to take the details and stuff and add them up a little bit more into it so that it's ready. And then from there we can just expand on the encounters and go into the next thing. We're going to use contingency, of course, uh, for the process, as usual. We got the, the modules up here, and we'll just hop right into it. Chat's up. So this module, uh, I did this module yeah, a ways back. Uh, extracted it from the world that it was in when we did the um, division, I guess you could say, of the multiverse out to the DMs, GMs, and GOs that were running some of those consistent in those different world spaces. Basically took the world that I had designed, the modules that I had designed, and pushed those out to those DMs, GMs, and GOs, and let them just continue and take off with it. Because um, we don't uh, really, you know, prior to the COVID phase, we were already doing some remote uh, adventure running, and they travel and they move around and their groups and stuff are sort of where they're at. So instead of having to run the 10 or 12 different groups every week, I let them sort of take up the reins on that. They were all trained up and everything to do it. So um, they took those world spaces and I kept the foundational modules, the ones that I used uh, to kick off the different worlds. I kept those for myself, uh, kept them in my repertoire. And I use them and bounce them around, revisit them, uh, rehash them a bit, and then and go through and do some design. But this one, Taste of Silver, foundationally was already in place uh, well enough to grab the details out. So I was working on it eh, a couple weeks ago. I actually have a module that's happening after this one. So this one is pre-harvest. And then I have a module that's harvest uh, duration. And then I'll have a winter module for the three little uh, breakdowns. Because the world of Gricor has seasons. We know this. Uh, we've been designing it for a while. Since uh, mid-July, we were working on the world of Gricor. And it's off and on. A couple days uh, every other week or every couple weeks, we were doing some runs there. Pretty steady, two times a week uh, for a month or so there. So really not even 30 days into the world build for Gricor at all. Uh, when you add up the days and the times, it's not even 30 days. Maybe we're at the 20-day stage, if at most, uh, of actual time. Because streams and stuff, we only did a couple hours here, a couple hours there. So it doesn't really add up as much. I mean, the duration of time has been over a span, but the overall time in its cumulative number, not much. Not much at all. So... I try to keep it under 30 days to do a complete world build, if at all, um, usually less than that. I try to make it where I've got all the modules in place to run all the different locations, so you can just pick a module and grab it. They can be run sequentially. They can be run hop around, and there's tie-in factors that you can use to tie them together if you want to bridge the modules. And then there's some that are timeline oriented that are occurring to help the DM, GM, or GO build the world space out with their group so they can go through the modules in, in a fashion that helps them to build the world in a way that they need it to be built uh, so it fits their group or to play it and slowly layer in the different parts of the world. So you're not just sitting there going, okay, this is the world and you need to know all this information for the world. That process doesn't really work as well, uh, dumping that much uh, lore onto the thing. So you like to use the modules to help give the lore up. That's what you do. Uh, you do build the books for the worlds and such. You'll have a world module uh, sort of pairing there. But the overall, let's say a cosmological standpoint, if you have a world and you have all the details for the world and everything else, you got to make sure that when you're doing that part of the design that you're not 
putting the entirety of it in there. You're setting up the prehistory of the world space, and you're getting the most current points of activity that are happening in the world, and they can choose to or not do anything with those. They could just build from the history of it. And you try to make the history make sense in a way that it's learned quickly. You don't want it like 50 pages of, let's just say, textual dates and timelines and such like that, because that can get a little monotonous. You want to have a good flow of the history space, and that's about it. And we may actually have some time to go over uh, that in its entirety. Uh, we might be able to do that today. That's possible. Probably be later on, but for now, we're going to stick with this module, Taste of Silver. So I've got everything in place. Um, some of these kind of bumped around a bit. It's around here. Some of these, the text size, I got to do a little adjust here. I think the eight works the best, but that's okay. So module wise, this module, we know that the world of Grigor is being built on the concept of three entities working in some fashion for their own gain. And it could be anything. It could be environmental, it could be NPC, it could be character-based. And those three aspects are kind of tugging and pulling. Eventually, by the way of our foundational design, because we built the world from the foundational module, from that platform, we're building the entirety of everything for the world space. Everything is easy to understand because it's dealing with the concept of three things primarily. And two of those three things are eventually going to be working together against the other third entity. So whatever it happens to be. So in this instance, for the Taste of Silver, in the module, I didn't put in anything that tied that aspect in. So I had to place that into the module. And because the Taste of Silver was a foundational module, which is the only modules I usually take and extract out for later use, because foundational modules, which no one uses, just the contingency system utilizes it. A foundational module has a platform structure in there that you can use to build infinitely. It's a design that I uh, built out using 357, which, again, doesn't exist anywhere in tabletop RPG or anywhere else. It is just a design process, a formulaic design process that I built, self-checking system to help build a world space quicker. Uh, module, adventure, book even, you could build whatever with it. Um, the formula for it is designed for that purpose. So Grigor is built on three. So this module is sort of set around the concept of there are the civilization, space-wise, doing their thing. And then you have the wilds. And in the wilds, there's this breakdown of two different entities happening there. So we already sort of made the division. In the wilds, there's a faction that is supportive of the civilized space and understanding that they exist as well. And then the other aspect of the wilds is the space that wants to remain the wilds and wants to eliminate the civilization. It is encroaching in their area. So those two different ones, one in supportive and one against. So we already know that the, the wilds in support of has already made its presence in the world of Grigor. Um, the, the druids, uh, some of the witch covens, there is uh, some of the sort of fey-ish creatures, even the wizards. Some of them are more um, Merlin-esque, I guess you could say, where they exist in the wild spaces and outside of civilized uh, world space, right? They stay exclusively in that area. Sort of, you know, I'm alone in the world aspect. They may interact with it, they may not. The things that they do might be in support of, it may not. So it just kind of depends on who we're dealing with. So I added in the lunar aspect of the world because we're sort of using the modules to layer in the aspects of the world space. So I wanted to utilize the core modules that we're building here. 
specifically by design using contingency by design we are purposefully building these modules to do something and the thing we're doing is to help build the world so the first module begins building the world space by the time we get to this module we're starting to take a wider view of the world space things happening off world and how that affects the on world space so the lunar aspect of uh, Grigor, we didn't do anything with, but we know there's going to be three, right? That's the, the pitch of the whole thing. So there's three moons orbiting the world of Grigor, two consistently working in tandem to each other, right? So you've got two moons cycling the sky. You can see them. They happen regularly. And then the wider orbital of this third moon puts it in a way where it's either behind the other ones and you can't quite see it, it's not prominent, or it cycles in front of them. I'm kind of thinking the orbital as them being lined up around it. So like Earth, as an example, we have our moon and its distance from the Earth. If there was another moon behind our moon, which technically there is a chunk of, another moon behind our moon that orbits uh, with that same pace, you would see them together and they would be making their rotations for the day and night cycle. That third moon may be hindered. Uh, you might not see it at all. And that is this instance where it has a sort of uh, elliptical, not uh, orb-shaped orbit. So it's not perfectly orbiting uh, the world of Grigor. And when it does reach the space, when it is closest to the world of Grigor, events occur. It has a tremendous pull. So the three moons, we have Melun, the sister moon. We have Davos, the brother moon. And then we have Mehor, the blood moon. And these three moons are constantly tugging and pulling and doing their thing. So when the two moons, the brother and sister moon, constantly being chased by this blood moon, so to speak. I kind of pulled on, when I did the module originally, the um, Red Riding Hood sort of fantastical space where you have someone defiantly traveling through a, a location and in the background, there is this force at work, observing, waiting, waiting for that moment in which they think they can get to where they would like. And there's that third entity, you know, the grandmother's house. The wolf wants in grandma's house. And he's going to get in there any way he can. Eventually he does. And waits for Red Riding Hood. And then when Red Riding Hood shows up, she's doing her thing. Unbeknownst to her, the huntsmen are also available, right? And they patrol and know, odd, Grandma would be up this late, so to speak, and shows up and finds the wolf ready to attack Red Riding Hood and grandmother will assume dead at this point. And then Red Riding Hood takes over grandma's house and huntsman and blah, blah, blah. So that's one pitch. Well, in this instance, for us, we're using the um, foundational build to extract something from this event happening. So these three entities moving around have caused some things to happen, but we, we know there's two other aspects. So we have the moons, and then we have something in the wilds and something in the civilization. So we have everything working together, foundational through the entire process. So I had to develop the proactive, the I want civilization to exist. It does no harm to us. We can live in harmony, so to speak, wilds, and whatever that aspect is. And then we needed the one counter to that, something working against it. So the blood moon, Mahor, when it happens in its cycle, it's happening soon in this module. And that event will occur, and it brings with it its things that it has. In the wilds, these two entities that are back and forth, pro and con to civilization, that's happening all the time, whether civilization realizes it or they do not. Those two are battling it out. One may win over 
and then move on, right? We had that aspect of good could fail, evil could prevail, and then it is one-to-one -one with the civilization at that point. If the good wins out, then the evil takes its, its leave for a, a span and then is replaced by another evil because there's always that balance between them. There's always something working against and something working for. It's just the way that it works, right? Like gravity. Something working for and something working against. The orbit and rotation of the Earth moving things away from the Earth or pulling things towards the Earth. You have things outside of the atmosphere pushing in. There's all these different forces at work. So we're doing that aspect. So in here we have um, the pitch was originally I had in here under the moonlit leaves. Got to get my hands working. Hands have been just not properly functioning. I'm doing too much work, physical. Text-based, like typing, that's easy on my hands, but smashing stuff with hammers and chopping wood and everything, that's rough. Okay. So we'll just type this a bit here, basically as it is. a bit of typing here and then we'll go over it. So a pretty straightforward one. Let me just kind of scooch this a bit. Do a little adjust. So this isn't being cut off here. Okay. So we know we got things happening previously that sets the stage. Always when a module is taking place. I don't want everything that's happening to be required on the module. I want there to be some pre-existing things that have transpired or historically have transpired by what they say, we'll say. Um, that sets sort of a foundation for the module to be built from. That way you can always say, okay, well, I want to take this a different direction and use this to do something else. And you're not undermining the construction of the module itself. So the module is helping build instead of being absolved and something different is being built completely. You want it to be a supportive structure. That's what it's there for. The module is a supportive structure. It should be doing that process. So it has to have uh, instructional. It has to have the capability to expand and contract backwards and forwards, inside out, upside down, right, in every direction in whatever way, shape, or form, and not lose its uh, aspect. And foundational, which is the best, which helps to build out a framework for future modules. You want it to not be the only thing. You want more things to happen after it, right? So under the moonlight uh, or the moonlit leaves of the silver wood, one can befriend monsters. It is also said that monsters there are to be feared. Ever since the woodsmen have ventured into this magical wood for its timber, eyes have been upon them. 
not all to do harm, but to protect those that enter the woods. Acts of ages past fulfilled. And that is just the pitch. Nothing else, just basically that. Now, in this, I also had put uh, some other tidbit information. But we know, foundational-wise, we don't want to put too much of that in there. We want to extract that and put that into other sections so that someone seeing this and utilizing this has better division. Previously, when I used these, my Adventure Builder was not quite the same. Uh, and over the years, I had made changes to it to this point, which has been about 20 years, 25 years of it being in this current context. Because this context works better um, in separating things so it's easily, one, referenceable, two, understandable, and three, it has a pacing of that information. So you're not being drowned by too much. It's separating things purposefully. So we know in just this thing, we're covering the aspects of monsters exist in the Silverwood. Some feared and some that can be friended. Three, three key things. Done with that. We know there are woodsmen there that enter the woods. And it's for the magical wood, it's timber itself, for whatever purpose. Did not specify, they're there for the wood itself. And while they're there, they are being watched. Not by one particular part of that monster entity, but by both of them. And the one has a pact from ages previous to protect those that are in the woods. So we've set the stage with just that for the concept of adventure. Something can happen. With just that, you can build from that. Foundation. Purposefully foundation. So let's get this font size back down to 8. And I'll probably end up changing them all through this whole thing to 8. 8 works better. In reality, I could shrink it down another notch. But I want to make sure that you guys can see it, which you can. Um, even on devices, because I'm looking on the phone here, so you can see it if you turn the, uh, your device sideways or whatever and landscape it out, it, it's got good view to it. So I check that to make sure this is the optimal, a 161% scale in LibreOffice. All right, so in the notes and the module, because uh, this module is fairly extensive, I built this one foundational, but I also added a lot of stuff into it because... I ran the module without it actually having a world space. The module was just the module, and it was able to be put wherever. So this pact that these monsters have to protect anything within the woods is prior to the current age, and that is important information. So prior to the current age, they're working as if this still exists. Those entities could be long gone. And in essence, that pact, null and void, could be. But in their mindset, it's for their existence. They will continue to do this, no matter whether the person or party or whatever the case may be that caused the pact to form. They're continuing with. So I also put in here that a legend speaks of dark times ahead and a moon of blood red. If ever the woods was in need of heroes, now would be the time. And that was that ending pitch part. So I'm moving that, extracting that out from that, and I'm moving it down to the introduction because the introduction part should pitch that part in there instead of where I had it in the overview. The overview should remain foundational. So introduction, we're starting to slowly specify additional things that are building the layers of the module itself. And that's how we do it uh, with our thing. So uh, that will be the opening statement here. Legend speaks of So we know the moon already.
Let's see here. I don't know, we'll try to get it close and see if this dictionary finds it. I need to expand dictionary out in LibreOffice. It's not that great. Whatever. Too tired to think about spelling today, so close enough. I know what it says. I'm going to shrink this a bit so we know 7 is pretty good. I might shrink this one to 7 as well. Kind of line her up. Scooch that over. Bring that in a bit. Yeah, seven I think is probably going to be the key size. That will give me enough room to do what I need to do. All right, so we've got uh, a legend speaks of dark times ahead and a moon of blood red. Mayhor, the blood moon, brings with it more than just a malevolent light. Mayhor has a following. 
and an impact of its lunar light changes things or end the the impact of its lunar light changes things within the world of Griffith. Darker powers within the world preach of the coming of Mahor and a description of balance or a disruption of balance. If ever there was a need for heroes, now would be it. Uh, the animosity between the clans that exist in the Silverwood outlasts kingdoms, even the kingdom of Verso. Though the lady carries over those packs into their lands, the Silverwood is not all bound by those lost kingdoms. So, that gives me some room. Let's see. I don't know if I want to limit it to nightly. Maybe we'll just say civilized world and probably the best. All right, so legend speaks of dark times ahead and the uh, and a moon. Got a moon there somewhere. A moon of blood red. Mayhor the blood moon brings with it more than just a malevolent light. Mahor has a following, and the impact of its lunar light changes things within the world of Grigor. Darker powers within the world preach of the coming of Mahor and a disruption of balance. If ever there was a need for heroes, now would be it. The animosity between the clans that exist in the Silver Wood outlasts kingdoms, even the kingdom of Versailles. Though the lady carries over those packs into their lands, the Silver Wood is not all bound by those lost kingdoms. The Garu, peaceful shapeshifters of the Silver Wood, have always been seen as guardians. Their counterpart, the followers of Mahor, work against the civilized world. So that is the pitch for that space. Basically, the followers of Mahor... Okay, so we're dealing with um, these shape changers. So they're lichens, more or less. So you've got the different animal entities that exist in the Silverwood, and they shape change into a humanoid version of them. Some of them shape change into an animalistic version no human hybrid. It just depends on which clan you're dealing with. So there's a variety there. It gives some room for the DMG or GO to create a bit within the space or utilize what we have. So design-wise, um, we have quite a few things happening. There's also um, a, a third part to that. Um, not just those forms, but a creature of that carrying the bloodline to spawn more and that's what happens in the next module after this one that one of those ancient creatures that actually created that uh, that brought that into existence actually comes out of where it is at um, it's been existing in solitude more or less and makes its way within the world space and we know that these towers that exist in the world of Grigor that bind the three planes of existence. This kingdom of Vercel built these. But that's not to say they're the only towers that were created in that instance to bind or create travel within the different realms. 
There are others. They just must be destroyed or have been destroyed. And that's the case. One of these broken towers uh, from a previous age is what is discovered by this thing in a different plane of existence. And it makes its way into the regular uh, material world, right? During the harvest, which normally is a peaceful time, right? So we had to set the we had to set the stage of what are we dealing with? That's this module, and then the module that happens after the the, uh, the harvest after the blood moon. The harvest occurs where the, the blood moon, the woods aren't safe. It's dangerous. Already they know the closer it gets to the blood moon, the more dangerous the woods become. The blood moon's there. The events occur, the blood moon passes, there's that fade out of the blood moon, and then it's back to uh, good times, basically. So that's when the harvest usually occurs. But something has made its way through during this module span of time. While these things and events that are occurring happen, something makes its way into the world space. It's not being... This is what's being dealt with. That thing isn't being dealt with, and it makes its way in. Could be purposeful. Someone could do this. Or maybe this thing coming through is sort of like a manifestation of Mahor, which in Grigor, they kind of they kind of think of the world of Grigor. There really isn't deities per se. The higher forces that are at work are more uh, natural and ancient. I would consider them like arachnamentals or primordial in that instance. But there is this sort of like ascended power that exists that's broken. So they can't really do what deities do, but they do have a power in the world space. And they can do things to change events and alter things from happening to a point. They're not allowed to break the system just to bring it back into balance. And that's about it. So their powers are very limited, and that could have been put in place a long time ago uh, for the world of Grigor, just to eliminate some of the stupidity that happens when you make an all-powerful being and don't take into consideration what happens when that person starts to do things or that thing starts to do things. If it's not in the interest of, worlds could end, right? So, background. Um, let's see here. Let's drop that down to seven. I like seven. Seven's working pretty good. Kind of slider over there. All right. So in the background on here, I have, in the days past, the Lycan clans made a pact with the woodsmen of the Silver Wood, vowed to keep the woods clear of monstrous threats in exchange. They only asked to hunt freely in the plentiful woodland realms. Woodsmen agreed, uh, as the beasts venturing forth from the Fey realms were plentiful. Woodsmen and Lycans agreed that no one must ever be harmed by a Lycan or the pact would be void. In agreement, the Lycans made safe the woods and hunted every full moon. Uh, the citizens came to know the Lycans as protectors. Uh, their fear of them and the woods began to fade. Many years have passed and a great many more moons. The Lycan leaders and citizens living in, the sheltered, uh, living in sheltered harmony. A fortnight ago, things changed. Under a lunar eclipse, the woods fell silent, and an eerie cry filled the air. That was what I had listed the background as before. So, mentality-wise, I don't want the woodsmen being the ones that created this pact. I want them to be the entity that does not have any clue how any of this transpired. They just are leery either way, and perhaps stories have made their way into the space where something happened in a positive note. And those stories exist just as much as those things happening in a negative note. So it's anyone's game, so to speak. I don't want to solidify it one way or the other too much. So the pact will create some name for it. So we'll say the pact of the moon. For now, and we'll play around with that later on. Probably the next time that we stream, we'll delve into it a bit because I've got different 
tidbits within the modules that are building the world space out. Each module is adding some other layer in in a more learned environment instead of just drowning someone with all the details. It's just too much to do that when you're building a world. But I want the world built. You know, I want it to be able to be used without all the extra work. So this helps them to be able to take points of it and say, oh, okay, well, if I change that instance of that, it begins here. And then that instance, when it is repeated somewhere else, I know of it, and I can simply swap it up. It's that working together with those that are consuming the product. You know what I mean? You want to have that back and forth happening. I might not be setting at the table, but the way that I'm producing the product that will be at the table is in that fashion as if I'm sitting there in a seat and I'm designing along with them and support that support structure needs to be there back and forth. And that's all I ever do. I don't ever design it in a fashion where, well, you'll figure it out. Or, well, if you want to change what I did, then you're just going to have to do all this stuff and figure out where it is all through here. Nah, 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 nah. I want to make sure that the support structure is in place. Foundation, right? So the Pact of the Moons has lingered. Even as
Okay. So, the Pact of the Moons has lingered in Grigor, past those fallen kingdoms. Even as Vercel has fallen and taken up its place as a broken kingdom, to some it has yet to be expunged completely. Vercel could rise again, and the Lady Vercel has done much to put that into motion. None shall be harmed by those bound by the pact. It is their life over those they are to protect, but not foolishly. Again, those three aspects, right? The Garu live by this, and in turn hunt far into the realms further south, even some living among the outskirts of the towns and villages, watchers for Mahor's life. The coming of Mahor is very real. Even though its rotation around the world of Grifor is abstract, it is still predictable to some extent. Its events, though, are not. Mahor unleashes more than its followers. It provides chaos unto Grifor. And that is kind of the, uh, the pitch of it. So, the moon is on its way. How soon? It's only predicted. Not accurate, so to speak. They don't know for sure. They're just guessing. So, let's see. In this pitch down here, I have them labeled as the Black Blood, which is what those forces are. So, let's see here. I don't have anything else. All right, so. Black Blood.
Let's do it this way. Um, okay, I don't want this to push too much. Just building some of the background in. So I have to make sure we're utilizing things we've already covered and showing how that brings this module into the world that this module belongs in the space in the way that it is supporting that structure. It's utilizing things that we already know and adding tidbits in. So we've covered a couple here as I'm typing this out, and I want to add in um, that final one that sort of sets up the module um, for the duration of time that it's been since 
Mayhor has been in the skies, more or less. So, because I want there to be a span where there is an unknown. Something happens to cause the world space to know something is up. What? They don't know. They only know that things have changed a bit. So I put uh, the Black Blood, those counter to the Guru, have manifested beasts within themselves against the natural processes. Through ritual consumption or exposure, the black blood became monstrous. They are not born with it. They worship the power it brings, not just Mahor. Its leaders preaching Mahor's light as a support structure to further the powers of the lunar light. Does it possess the power? Perhaps. Little more is known of Mahor besides its strange appearance within the skies of Grikor. There is no denying that the black blood are a curse. Binding themselves to creatures of darker intent only enhances their vile nature. Many beneath the world civilized spaces, those looked down upon, eventually make their way into the calling of Mahor. There was a time when Mahor brought such evils upon Grigor that realms were lost. Before the current age, the Black Blood were mostly myths, so little in number, but feared much the same. Now packs of Black Blood roam the wilds, some elusive others purposeful upon the civilized worlds. Priests of Mahor have been hunted. Even the Guru and the Night Sanctuary were one for a time, tracking down these entities of Mahor's light. It has been a span where Mahor has remained veiled, behi hidden behind the sibling moons, as Maelun the sister and Davos the brother continued across the nightly skies. Mahor has always been in pursuit. With nothing more than prediction, Mahor has been consistent. So the two moons, and then at some point, Mahor spans across the sky. They're never present, we'll say, at the same time. Like, as one is leaving, one may appear, right? 
kind of the, the concept of it. The two, Melun and Davos, are always present in the skies together. And it's always like, then Mayhor shows up. You know, it's like constantly chasing. So we'll have to see uh, how we're going to pitch that out. Perhaps all three moons will be in the sky at the same time, or perhaps they're there and then they're not moving and uh, Mayhor is catching them, you know? Um, so let's see here. Uh, yeah, Mayhor has been consistent. So it has been several cycles and Mayhor has not been seen. In this third cycle before the harvest, the skies above above Grikor are red when light fades, as if Mahor's coming approaches. So, they have not seen Mahor for two cycles. The moon's passed, no Mahor. The moon's passed again, no Mahor. This is the third cycle of the moons. And as the moons fade, this red takes the skies. So, they know something's happening. Mayhor is obviously approaching and it's when is that going to happen so my thought process was when I had run this before I had made a sort of a chart a lunar chart and I put the moons and I put the moon that was approaching and I had the moons um, go through their cycles and as the turn sequences, as the uh, adventures pursued, right, on uh, each of the encounters, the moon was slowly gaining ground, eventually catching up to the other moon and eclipsing it, more or less. So the blood moon eclipse happens and then something bad occurs. And it only, in this instance, we're using that natural cycle, so to speak, the blood moon eclipse will trigger that binding of the planes of existence and overlap, so to speak. And then this entity that we'll take and utilize for that next module will be able to make its way through into the world space. It will activate those towers that are from ages past, and it makes its way through, basically opening a gate, and it comes in. So even though the module will occur as the module, we're creating the next module, what happens after. We're already putting that seed into the world space. So in the last encounter, space-wise, we'll have the eclipse occur, things will transpire, even the black blood will be like, wait a minute now, that's not right, and they'll leave, more or less. Whether the heroes are successful in that instance or they just retreat, something's up, even the bad guys know, and they depart. And then it seems like all is well. There will be a span of time, and then there'll be the realization that something made its way into the world space. And that will be how that uh, ends up being changed. So quest-wise, um, I'm not going to delve into those. Usable names I'm not going to delve into um, too much. I mean, I have some here, um, but these were tied to that world space. It uses a different language foundation, and I don't want to, I don't want to pull that into here. I want to keep Grigor Grigor. So um, we will have these. So Lycan's blood is one. And then we have the Fallen, which is an instance for them. And then the Covens of the Moon, like that. And those are the three hook parts, and we'll delve into it later on. All right, so the starting the adventure. What I had put in here is I had put... Beneath the canopy of silvery leaves and almost luminous trunks of the silverwood, you and your allies find what appears to be an overturned lumbering cart. Timbers from down trees on either side seem to block the natural terrain, and the overturned cart is blocking the logging road. It is eerily quiet. If the players venture forth, the sound of silence is broken by an owl's screech. 
Silently, it flies downward and lands atop the down cart, massively large, large enough to carry off a player character. It watches you. And that is the starting of the adventure module in that instance. But I actually put in sort of like another aspect in the background. So the leader of the Garu, Gorodrim, he's a chonky dude. And he has a owl that is his companion. Uh, whatever transpired for him to have that. Perhaps it is a deatific entity manifested in this animal form. Don't know. We know that the um, the Garu are totem style worshipping these entities. So the natural aspect like bears, wolves, owls, maybe even deer, who knows? There'll be that list of which ones they consider these protector style um, balance bringing or maintaining totems in the animal world. And we know that um, before the order, order of Osir, these druids, they know these guys exist. They're like another faction within the space, same space, right? They exist in the same same world space. But the Silverwood particularly is magical. So we know that there are these locations where things manifest more powerfully in the world of Grigor. And the Silverwood is one of those locations. The trees themselves are, are magical. They create a magical area. You know, it's like you're in the Silverwood, you know you're in the Silverwood. There's no mistaking it. You're not in the redwoods or, you know, the the trees of color or whatever. You're in the silver wood. And like here where I live, we have these trees, are popple trees, basically, um, silver popple. But one side of the leaves is sort of white. The other side's green. And when the light hits it, it sort of changes it a bit. And, and when it's getting towards nightfall, it kind of has that same thing. But the trunks of them aren't really white. They don't really luminous. They're mostly black and kind of look like this dark ichor uh, spilling down from them. They're a gross uh, tree. Um, dropping the branches all the time. They're super soft and uh, they have a tendency to just rot from the inside out, more or less. These trees are, are sort of like a, a nuisance, more or less. But they do provide shade and they do have this reaching root structure that once one exists, more start springing up. I mean, you could a whole forest could spring up quickly. And the roots have these huge sort of like nodules that stick out out of the ground. So you hit them with the lawnmower a lot. You didn't know it was there. Next day, you got this huge root structure where it's trying to sprout out um, another tree, more or less. So you have to think about the space in which you reside and maybe even the players reside and kind of build some of that stuff into your worlds. So it helps to build it in. So the silver wood is more magical where the trunks are sort of luminous at night when the lunar lights of the brother and sister moon hits the trees, they change. But when Mayhor is there, those trees take on that darker tone. And I wanted the fort, like how I described it when I ran the modules, is the players have been in the woods for a bit. They were at the lodge with the huntsman. Um, harvest was approaching. They had no idea this module had even existed, thought process-wise. Uh, they know that the blood moon had not been uh, in appearance for some span. The hunters were kind of like, "Why? where is Mayhor, you know? Usually it's in chasing, and they kind of got that aspect of the world where the two moons are there. And then Mayhor chases them, that sort of thing. So in that instance, when that's happening, and you're sort of building, the, you kind of get that, that ramp up of what's about to happen. Don't know. And when they were in the woods, it was like they're traveling. There's that lunar uh, luminous happening with the trees. And then 
the moons are sort of moving past and the sky gets darker and then that red glow sort of hits and the trees go dark like the trees trunk wise the luminous ends the silver reflection turns to sort of like this red glow above them and everything is just dark. It's like somebody walked in and turned the light switch off because the trees actually provide some light where it's sort of like, you know, a dancing, reflecting here and there. Shadows aren't quite as prominent within the woods, so it's easy to navigate. Well, it just went dark and there's like, we can't see nothing. You know, the trees' trunks went black and someone's like, something's wrong, you know? And then that was like that eerie sort of like red glow sort of continuing across the sky and... The sky fills and there's sort of like that peak of Mahor. Um, in this instant, it was just a blood moon. So there's that peak of the blood moon kind of up on the one side. And then there was that eerie sound that they hear. And the players are like, frick. And we were running it uh, holiday event-wise. We were running this Halloween time, right? Because we're getting towards that that run. And I ran this module during that. Was The holiday event was this module. We ran this one. And I kind of pitched it in that one. That sort of like uh, suspense horror pitch that things were to happen when the players were in there and it was dark i mean they lit a torch and the torch wasn't as light as it, it should have been uh, that natural light was different in color it didn't look like actual flame it had a different look to it and they're like why is the torch like that and then that's when that sort of like they hear that sound and then that that um owl came down and landed on that cart up ahead in the trail and it had some sort of luminous to it. But when it landed and the players were looking, they're just like, okay, something's up. They see the cart, it's overturned. It was like drawing attention to something they couldn't see. And when they seen the owl and there was sort of like that light around where it was, like it's warning them, this is not a good space to be. And the players were like, crap. So they were readied. And then they got attacked by the, the black blood. They ended up killing most of them and you know, or taking them out, wounding them. And then one of them stepped forward, one of these black bloods, and changed their shape from a beast into a man. And just kind of observed them for a moment and kind of went back and they gathered up their, their fallen or injured or whatever and, and went back into the darkness. And then it was like daytime approached. And it was like the red faded and the trees returned to what they were again. It was like It was like something paused... Um, the natural order of things and they were like crap and that's how that module sort of pitched in so i won't do the starting the adventure module part today um, at least right now i'm going to go back through here and, and make some notes on this module from what we've got here just a bit later i'm gonna uh, get some food get these guys uh, in bed and then take a bit of a break like i said setting and stuff has been bothering my legs uh, they just they're aching bad so until i get the info back from the doctor on what the heck happened i'm gonna have to um keep these short and sweet more or less so we've been on for about an hour or so that's pretty good we got this part here and i wanted to get that and ch chat about it a bit because we're gonna hop back into um doing more of the Grikor when we're doing the tabletop rpg and we're gonna get these modules in so the i want to get this module uh, wrapped up and i don't know we may work on the module later on here today we might jump into something else but i just wanted to get this one sort of in there and get the the vibe going for it uh, we'll probably work on it tomorrow uh for sure uh there'll be a little span of time in there tomorrow i'll have so we'll, we'll jump in and do a little bit tomorrow and then maybe tuesday maybe thursday we'll see i'm gonna kind of do a few here and there but definitely you can't just do a huge run on it um I got to try and keep my body intact. <laughs> the pain level is, is pretty pretty decent. Enough for me that it's past my tolerance levels. So I'll take a break, uh, do what I got to do, get these guys fed, and then we'll probably hop back on. It'll be a little bit, maybe towards our normal slot of time, a couple hours or so. Uh, if not, it'll be at the normal time, 10. We'll hop back on and get on for an hour or so. Do a little more chit chatting about it do a little more design work and then like i said we'll probably hop back on tomorrow maybe afternoon uh maybe just our normal 10 o'clock time or something we'll see uh but yeah thanks for watching uh 
we're working on this module. And we'll hop in and do some more uh, on the other modules because we've got a couple going here. I like to have a few going where we can hop around and show how you bridge them together, how you, you map them so they support each other because that's what they are. They're a support structure for the world space. So, But yeah, thanks for watching. Appreciate it. And I will see you in the next one.